Welcome to the very first webinar in the Financial Friday series. My name is Derek Watson and today I'm very pleased to be introducing Julian Lowe. Julian is an independent financial advisor with Money for Dentists and has kindly agreed to talk to us about what to do if you are unable to work for any reason, how to ensure continuity of care for your patients during that period and how to safeguard your wealth if you are unable to perform clinical work. So, over to Julian. Thank you, Derek, uh, and uh, welcome to uh, all our listeners. As you say, my name is Julian Lowe uh, from uh, Money for Dentists. We're a national uh, firm of IFAs and the UK's leading expert independent financial advisors to dentists. The title of this talk is Your Financial Responsibilities as a Dentist, and briefly covers sorry, those areas in the GDC standards and principles that are impacted by financial planning. These are the areas relating to the continuity of patient care, your cooperation with others in meeting that standard and maintaining relevant knowledge so as to maintain professionalism. I have a number of case studies to illustrate the common areas we get involved in and some of the pitfalls that dentists often fall into. I'm going to start with Tom and Jennifer, which revolves around your obligation to cooperate with other members of the dental team in the interests of providing continuity of patient care, which of course you won't be able to do if you're off sick. Now how you tackle this problem will depend on a number of factors where your income is coming from and in what proportion, whether it's NHS, practice plan or similar or fee per item. And here I'd like to dispel a, a couple of myths in respect of NHS sick pay. Most associates feel that as self-employed individuals they're not entitled to NHS sick pay, whereas in fact if they have two years service and that includes a year as a VDP or VT, they are entitled to receive sick pay from weeks four to week uh, 26 at the rate that they were earning immediately before illness. Unfortunately, the associate contract also usually stipulates that after usually a period of two to four weeks that they have to provide a locum uh, in order to fulfill their obligations to the practice. And locum cover is usually more expensive than the uh, sick pay that you'll be receiving. So nevertheless, there is a, uh, a need there to provide some additional finances. Now, having analysed your particular situation, we can then see which type of cover suits you best. And the usual three contracts that will enable you to do this are to provide a replacement dentist, meet your ongoing overheads if you're the principal, and pay your own household expenses, a locum cover, practice expenses insurance, and income protection. However, it's rare that any one of these will do the job properly in isolation. And the solution usually lies in a correct mix of two or even all three. The pitfalls we commonly find clients falling into are illustrated by the cases of Tom and Jennifer, who thought they had this problem sorted, but for one reason or another, actually hadn't. Now, Tom has always used the bank advisor and had sorted his income protection through them. And as you may be aware, there are currently three types of advisor. There are tied agents that work for one individual company. There are multi-tied, uh, the likes of Wesleyan, for example, who are an insurance company themselves, but then use the products of another three or four companies as well. And there are independent financial advisors. And in this instance, not only do the advisors have the whole of market available to them in terms of products, but they are advice orientated rather than product orientated, and legally act as agents for the client, not the insurer, as in the other two cases. Now, Tom's advisor was tied to the bank's assurance company, so only had one income protection product available to him. And unfortunately, that product had an any occupation disability definition. Now, there are three definitions of disability within an income protection contract. There's own occupation, which pays out if you're unable to carry out your own occupation, as the title suggests, i.e. clinical dentistry. Suited occupation, which pays out if you're unable to carry out your own occupation or any occupation that is deemed suitable by way of education and training. So, so as a qualified dentist, the insurer would argue that you're more than qualified to teach or carry out research, for example, and so wouldn't pay out simply because you're unable to carry out clinical dentistry. Any occupation only pays out if you're unable to carry out any occupation at all, and I would suggest you'd have more chance of claiming on your life insurance than that, which is why some companies have never paid a claim. So in short, anything other than an own occupation definition is actually no proper cover at all. 
Now, Tom's principal, Jennifer, had a different problem in that she had done her own thing and taken out locum cover and an income protection plan separately. And whilst, as I said earlier, this combination may provide a comprehensive solution, in this instance, Jennifer had arranged the policy so that they both paid out at the same time. This overlap of cover doesn't work because the income is affected by any continuing income. And if the locum is doing her work for her, she'll still be receiving an income and therefore the income protection won't pay out. So duplicate cover is a waste of money. Now technically, Jennifer has ensured the continuity of care of her patients. She's just wasted a lot of money in the way that she's gone about it. But as you can see, both these dentists thought that they had their situation covered, but in reality they hadn't, which is why I would suggest that IFAs go to dentists to look after their oral health and dentists go to specialist IFAs to look after their financial planning. And now onto a subject that you all need to know about. I am, of course, referring to the EU Gender Directive. Now, this piece of European lunacy, or, or European legislation, I beg your pardon, uh, dictates that as of the 21st of December this year, insurers are no longer able to discriminate on the grounds of sex. And this applies to everything from car insurance to life insurance. Up until now, we have celebrated the differences between men and women by acknowledging that women live longer than men, so they get cheaper life insurance. Women have less car accidents than men, and so get cheaper car insurance. Whilst men are statistically less likely to suffer a serious illness than women, and so get cheaper income protection and critical illness insurance. After this directive comes into force, all premiums will equalise, and there are unlikely to be any real winners, given that the EU are also doing away with a tax break that the life insurance companies currently benefit from, which is going to push costs up generally. So if you already have sufficient life cover, uh, so income protection and critical illness cover, and you have guaranteed rather than reviewable premiums, you should be unaffected. But every other male dentist needs to review their income protection and critical illness cover now, and all female dentists need to do so after the 21st of December. Despite the title, the pre previous slide that already looks these two are giving each other, I can assure you we are still on financial planning and haven't moved on to family planning. We are again here dealing with the continuity of patient care, but this time in respect of the death or critical illness of the dentist, rather than any temporary incapacity. There are a number of reasons for taking out life or critical illness protection, but they basically boil down to mitigating financial responsibility, whether that's to pay off a debt, to ensure the financial stability of your business, or to maintain the lifestyle that you have aspired for your loved ones and dependents. Such cover is necessary to ensure the continued smooth running of the practice in the event of death, critical illness, or even the loss of mental capacity, and is often a condition of your practice finance layer. But as always, there's a right way and a wrong way to do anything. Now, in this example, Chris and Benita have a practice in 50-50 partnership worth a million pounds, from which they both take regular income of 100,000 a year, and despite the adoring looks, they're both married to other non-dentists. Now, Chris decides he needs some life insurance to cover his family, and his first thought is to insure himself for 1.5 million, which would give his family a 75,000 pound a year income at a 5% rate of return, which is fine. However, if Chris dies, Chris's wife inherits the 1.5 million, and Chris is half of the practice. Benita is now with, left with a practice that is one dentist short, and possibly no longer worth a million pounds without Chris's input. Now, if this were a limited company, Benita could get an associate to replace him, but Chris's wife is still entitled to half the profits at the end of the year, on top of the 75000 a year she's getting for sitting at home doing nothing. But because this is a partnership, things could be even worse. As if they held an NHS contract, all the partners must be dentists. So Benita will be in danger of losing the NHS contract and possibly the practice altogether, unless she could buy Chris's share off his widow. But where is Benita going to get half a million pounds from in her current situation? In short, Chris's wife and family are okay, but his business partner is in serious trouble. The trick with all such problems is not simply providing a lump sum, but actually putting the right amount of money in the right hands at the right time. The way to do this properly is for Chris and Benita to insure themselves for 500,000 each, being the value of their half of the practice, by way of a partnership protection arrangement, leaving Chris to insure himself personally for a million pounds to make up the difference.
and for simplicity we'll leave any of Benita's additional planning out of it. Now in this scenario, on Chris's death, Chris's wife inherits his half of the practice as before. The 500,000 partnership cover pays out to Benita via a trust arrangement and the £1 million personal cover pays out to Chris's wife. The next stage is by way of a buy and sell cross option agreement set up as part of the partnership protection arrangement. Now this provides the option for either party to buy or sell the partnership and if exercised is binding upon the other party to comply. So Chris's wife can't keep her half of the practice and sell it to somebody else for example if Benita wants to buy it and Benita couldn't keep the money if Chris's wife wants to sell. So Benita buys Chris's share of the business from Chris's wife and Benita ends up with all of the practice and Chris's wife ends up with all of the money and everybody's happy. Well, as happy as they could be under the circumstances. And I hope that's demonstrated the difference between talking to people who are advice orientated rather than product orientated, which is reflected in the difference between taking out life assurance on the one hand and proper financial planning on the other, which as I said earlier, is all about putting the right amount of money in the right hands at the right time. And one of those hands won't be the taxman's. When considering any sort of life assurance, it is important that the tax implications are considered and that those policies are put in trust where appropriate so that the benefits fall outside of the estate for inheritance tax purposes. Will should be made and kept up to date because you can't provide continuity of care if you can't keep the practice running while the lawyers are sorting out the probate. Trusts can be written into your wills to protect the estates you have left against creditors including potential long-term care costs of a surviving spouse. So you can guarantee that your children will get something eventually, regardless of what happens after you've gone. And lasting powers of attorney are a must for anyone running a practice. What would happen if you lost mental capacity? Who would sign the checks, let alone run the practice, if you were in a coma or had had a stroke? All of these things need to be considered under a financial planning exercise. Well, hopefully that's ticked two of the boxes in terms of ensuring continuity of patient care, which just leaves us with the professionalism and trustworthiness. And the next case is that of Rabbi and Uzma, which demonstrates your need to maintain your knowledge in respect of NHS government and HMRC practice, so as not to breach your professionalism by contributing their rules. So it falls into the legal and ethical arena rather than the clinical. One of the most recent and dramatic changes in pension legislation was the reduction of the annual allowance, which stood at £255,000 before April 2011 and was hardly likely to catch out even the most affluent, down to £50,000 uh, in April 11, which places many more people in danger of overfunding. Now, dentists are particularly, uh, particularly at risk of this due to the workings of the NHS pension, and if this affects you, the leak reported in last week's press that the government are considering reducing this still further, possibly to £30,000 in the autumn statement, should have you seeking specialist independent advice immediately. But let's look at Rabbi. Rabbi's been an NHS dentist for the last nine years, earning around £160,000 per annum uh, from NHS activity. And he's contributing to the NSS pension scheme. And in addition, he's making a £10,000 annual contribution into a personal pension. Now he arrived at that £10,000 personal pension contribution with his accountant, who is not a dental specialist incidentally. His contribution is 10.9% of his NHS earnings, which is almost 17500 The NHS pay 14%, which is nearly 22500 So the total is just under £40,000, giving him ample room to top up his retirement with £10,000 to the £50,000 maximum. <coughs> if only it were that simple. When calculating much, how much of your annual allowance is used, schemes like the NHS don't simply add up how much you've paid in. Rather, they have to calculate the increase in pension, derive a capital value from that increase, and work it all backwards. Now, this is a simple matter of taking your career uprated earnings and an allowance for inflation, then dynamizing this to retirement, calculating your current anticipated pension, augment this with your tax-free cash entitlement, and then work backwards to a current cash equivalent value. Then include this year's income, do the whole exercise all over again, and calculate the difference. Now, the answer in Rabbi's case is that his pension input is classed as £48,545.
So, if Rabu pays the additional personal contri pension contribution, he's exceeded HMRC's limits by over eight and a half thousand pounds, and they are going to be very happy with it. And I don't suppose the GDC are going to be entirely pleased if he's on the front page of tax offences either. Usma's situation is quite the reverse. Nine years ago, her NHS private split was 90% NHS and 10% private, and she was only contributing to the NHS pension scheme, which should have given her a reasonable start in retirement planning. However, over the years, these figures have reversed, meaning she's now drastically under her retirement, and if left unaddressed, she won't be able to afford to retire and may have to continue working well into her 80s perhaps taking continuity of patient care to an entirely inappropriate extreme. So she needs to address the situation and consider some additional planning. And whilst there are all sorts of ways to save money for the future, a private pension has some advantages. Bear in mind that pension contributions attract tax relief at the highest rate paid. So as a 50% taxpayer, the government will match her contributions pound for pound, effectively doubling her money on day one. This is a very useful financial planning tool and can be extremely effective in other areas too, particularly when using the pension fund to purchase the practice property, as well as providing the desired level of income in retirement. A few other things to be aware of when it comes to pensions. Uh, as you probably are aware, the NHS scheme is changing again in 2015. Uh, at the end of the last slide, we'll have some contact details on it, including our website, so please keep in touch for updates on, on the website as and when further uh, details are released. Incorporation of associates. Many accountants, even some dental specialists, have recommended that associates incorporate in order to take advantage of paying lower corporation tax rather than the higher income tax. Those associates that carry out NHS work need to be aware that by doing so, they lose their rights to the NHS pension scheme and to NHS sick pay, even though they may still be paying for it. And lastly, for the principals, Work, the auto-enrolment into workplace pensions started on the 1st of October this year. It will affect you and you do need to know about it so as not to break the rules. However, if you start planning now, you can save yourself a lot of money by building it in over the years. That should have ticked the other box as far as your financial responsibilities are concerned and that's me about done. So I'm going to hand you back to uh, Derek and if anyone's got any questions, uh, they can uh, direct them through him and I'll be pleased to answer them as I'll be about for another few minutes. Thank you. Right, well, um, thanks very much, Julian. As I mentioned, I'm going to send everyone a link to the content mentioned in the webinar uh, and an email address for further inquiries. The next DFO webinar in the Financial Friday series will be on Friday the 14th of December at 1.10 p.m. when independent financial advisor Sarah Smith will be asking whether men and women need to carry out their financial planning in different ways with reference to a new EU directive on gender and we'll send you a link to that webinar in the email. Other training you might be interested in are the IT for Dental Professionals series which covers basic IT skills and Management Monday. Management Monday, the next speaker will be Sarah Buxton from Cohen Kramer Solicitors which specialises in dental employment issues, and that's on Monday the 10th of December at 1.10, conveniently designed to fit into your lunch hour. There is, of course, free CPD for all of the webinars available to DFO and DAPA members, and that about wraps it up. So thanks for your time and attention.